Fountain by Isaac Asimov Audiobook 10 of 14 Sufficient for the Grand Mastership itself, despite youth and enemies. And it is, sa it is safe. In what way? In that secrecy is the essence of its use, that same secrecy you described as the only safety with regard to nucleix. You may bury the transmuter in the deepest dungeon of the strongest fortress on your furthest estate, and it will still bring you instant wealth. It is the gold you buy, not the machine, and that gold bears no trace of its manufacture, for it cannot be told from the natural creation. And who is to operate the machine? Yourself. Five minutes teaching is all you will require. I'll set it up for you wherever you wish. And in return. Well, Ponyets grew cautious. I ask a price and a handsome one. It is my living. Let us say for it it's a valuable machine. The equivalent of a cubic foot of gold in wrought iron. Furl laughed, and Ponyets grew red. I point out, sir, he added, stiffly, that you can get your price back in two hours. True and in one hour, you might be gone, and my machine might suddenly turn out to be useless. I'll need a guarantee. You have my word. A very good one, Furl bowed sardonically, but your presence would be an even better assurance. I'll give you my word to pay you one week after delivery in working order. Impossible. Impossible? when you've already incurred the death penalty very handily by even offering to sell me anything. The only alternative is my word that you'll get the gas chamber tomorrow otherwise. Ponyet's face was expressionless, but his eyes might have flickered. He said, it is an unfair advantage. You will at least put your promise in writing. And also become liable for execution? No, sir. Furl smiled a broad satisfaction. No, sir. Only one of us is a fool. The traitor said in a small voice, It is agreed, then. 6. Gorif was released on the thirtieth day, and five hundred pounds of the yellowest gold took his place. And with him was released the quarantined and untouched abomination that was his ship. Then, as on the journey into the Asconian system, so on the journey out, the cylinder of sleek little ships ushered them on their way. Ponyets watched the dimly sunlit speck that was Gorif's ship while Gorif's voice pierced through to him, clear and thin on the tight, distortion-bounded ether beam. He was saying, but it isn't what's wanted, Ponyets. A transmuter won't do. Where did you get one, anyway? I didn't, Ponyets' answer was patient. I juiced it up out of a food irradiation chamber. It isn't any good, really. The power consumption is prohibitive on any large scale or the Foundation would use transmutation instead of chasing all over the galaxy for heavy metals. It's one of the standard tricks every trader uses, except that I never saw an iron to gold one before. But it's impressive, and it works. Very temporarily. All right. But that particular trick is no good. It got you out of a nasty spot. That is very far from the point. Especially since I've got to go back, once we shake our solicitous escort. Why? You yourself explained it to this politician of yours, Gorov's voice was on edge. Your entire sales point rested on the fact that the transmuter was a means to an end, but of no value in itself that he was buying the gold, not the machine. It was good psychology, since it worked, but but. Ponyet surged blandly and obtusely. The voice from the receiver grew shriller, but we want to sell them a machine of value in itself, something they would want to use openly, something that would tend to force them out in favor of nuclear techniques as a matter of self-interest. I understand all that, said Ponyet's gently. You once explained it. But look at what follows from my sale, will you? As long as that transmuter lasts, 
Frill will coin gold, and it will last long enough to buy him the next election. The present Grand Master won't last long. You count on gratitude? Asked Gorov, coldly. No. On intelligent self-interest. The transmuter gets him an election, other mechanisms no. No. Your premise is twisted. It's not the transmuter, he'll credit. It'll be the good, old-fashioned gold. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Ponyets grinned and shifted into a more comfortable position. All right. He'd baited the poor fellow sufficiently. Gorov was beginning to sound wild. The trader said, Not so fast, Gorov. I haven't finished. There are other gadgets already involved. There was a short silence. Then, Gorov's voice sounded cautiously, What other gadgets? Ponyets gestured automatically and uselessly, You see that escort? I do, said Gorov shortly. Tell me about those gadgets. I will. If you'll listen. That's Frill's private navy escorting us, a special honor to him from the Grand Master. He managed to squeeze that out. So. And where do you think he's taking us? To his mining estates on the outskirts of Ascone, that's where. Listen. Ponyets was suddenly fiery, I told you I was in this to make money, not to save worlds. All right. I sold that transmuter for nothing. Nothing except the risk of the gas chamber and that doesn't count towards the quota. Get back to the mining estates, Ponyets. Where do they come in? With the profits. We're stacking up on tin, Gorov. Tin to fill every last cubic foot this old scow can scrape up, and then some more for yours. I'm going down with Furl to collect, old man, and you're going to cover me from upstairs with every gun you've got just in case Furl isn't as sporting about the matter as he lets on to be. That tin's my profit. For the transmuter. For my entire cargo of nucleics. At double price, plus a bonus. He shrugged, almost apologetically. I admit I gouged him, but I've got to make quota, don't I? Gorov was evidently lost. He said, weakly, do you mind explaining? What's there to explain? It's obvious, Gorov. Look, the clever dog thought he had me in a foolproof trap, because his word was worth more than mine to the Grand Master. He took the transmuter. That was a capital crime in a scone. But at any time he could say that he had lured me on into a trap with the purest of patriotic motives, and denounce me as a seller of forbidden things. That was obvious. Sure, but word against simple word wasn't all there was to it. You see, Frill had never heard nor conceived of a microfilm recorder. Gorov laughed suddenly. That's right, said Ponyets. He had the upper hand. I was properly chastened. But when I set up the transmuter for him in my whipped dog fashion, I incorporated the recorder into the device and removed it in the next day's overhaul. I had a perfect record of his sanctum sanctorum, his holy of holies, with he himself, Porphyrl operating the transmuter for all the ergs it had and crowing over his first piece of gold as if it were an egg he had just laid. You showed him the results. Two days later. The poor sap had never seen three-dimensional color sound images in his life. He claims he isn't superstitious, but if I ever saw an adult look as scared as he did then, call me rookie. When I told him I had a recorder planted in the city square, set to go off at midday with a million fanatical Asconians to watch, and to tear him to pieces subsequently, he was gibbering at my knees in half a second. He was ready to make any deal I wanted. Did you? Gorov's voice was suppressing laughter. I mean, have one planted in the city square. No, but that didn't matter. He made the deal. He bought every gadget I had 
and every one you had for as much tin as we could carry. At that moment, he believed me capable of anything. The agreement is in writing and you'll have a copy before I go down with him, just as another precaution. But you've damaged his ego, said Gorov. Will he use the gadgets? Why not? It's his only way of recouping his losses, and if he makes money out of it, he'll salve his pride. And he will be the next Grand Master. And the best man we could have in our favor. Yes, said Gorov, it was a good sale. Yet you've certainly got an uncomfortable sales technique. No wonder you were kicked out of a seminary. Have you no sense of morals? What are the odds? said Ponyets, indifferently. You know what Salver Hardin said about a sense of morals. Part V The Merchant Princes One Traitors With psychohistoric inevitability Economic control of the foundation grew. The traitors grew rich, and with riches came power. It is sometimes forgotten that Haber Mallow began life as an ordinary trader. It is never forgotten that he ended it as the first of the merchant princes. Encyclopedia Galactica Jorain Sut put the tips of carefully manicured fingers together and said, It's something of a puzzle. In fact. And this is in the strictest of confidence. It may be another one of Harry Seldon's crises. The man opposite felt in the pocket of his short Smyrnian jacket for a cigarette. Don't know about that, Sut. As a general rule, politicians start shouting Seldon crisis at every mayoralty campaign. Sut smiled very faintly, I'm not campaigning, Mallow. We're facing nuclear weapons, and we don't know where they're coming from. Haber Mallow of Smyrno, master trader, smoked quietly, almost indifferently. Go on. If you have more to say, get it out. Mallow never made the mistake of being overpolite to a Foundation man. He might be an outlander, but a man's a man for a that. Sut indicated the trimensional star map on the table. He adjusted the controls and a cluster of some half-dozen stellar systems blazed red. That, he said quietly, is the Corellian Republic. The traitor nodded, I've been there. Stinking rat hole. I suppose you can call it a republic but it's always someone out of the Argo family that gets elected Comdor each time. And if you ever don't like it. Things happen to you. He twisted his lip and repeated, I've been there. But you've come back, which hasn't always happened. Three trade ships, inviolate under the conventions, have disappeared within the territory of the Republic in the last year. And those ships were armed with all the usual nuclear explosives and force field defenses. What was the last word heard from the ships? Routine reports. Nothing else. What did Coral say? Sut's eyes gleamed sardonically, there was no way of asking. The Foundation's greatest asset throughout the periphery is its reputation of power. Do you think we can lose three ships and ask for them? Well, then, suppose you tell me what you want with me. Jorain Sut did not waste his time in the luxury of annoyance. As secretary to the mayor, he had held off opposition councilmen, job seekers, reformers and crackpots who claimed to have solved in its entirety the course of future history as worked out by Harry Seldon. With training like that, it took a good deal to disturb him. He said methodically, in a moment. You see, three ships lost in the same sector in the same year can't be accident, and nuclear power can be conquered only by more nuclear power. The question automatically arises. If Coral has nuclear weapons, where is it getting them? And where does it? Two alternatives. Either the Coralians have constructed them themselves far-fetched. Very. But the other possibility is that we are being afflicted with a case of treason. You think so? Mallow's voice was cold. The secretary said calmly, there's nothing miraculous about the possibility. 
Since the Four Kingdoms accepted the Foundation Convention, we have had to deal with considerable groups of dissident populations in each nation. Each former kingdom has its pretenders and its former noblemen, who can't very well pretend to love the Foundation. Some of them are becoming active, perhaps. Mallow was a dull red. I see. Is there anything you want to say to me? I'm a Smyrnian. I know. You're a Smyrnian. Born in Smyrno, one of the former four kingdoms. You're a foundation man by education only. By birth, you're an outlander and a foreigner. No doubt your grandfather was a baron at the time of the wars with Anacreon and Loris, and no doubt your family estates were taken away when Sef Sermak redistributed the land. No, by black space, no. My grandfather was a blood-poor son of a spacer who died heaving coal at starving wages before the foundation took over. I owe nothing to the old regime. But I was born in Smyrno, and I'm not ashamed of either Smyrno or Smyrnians, by the galaxy. Your sly little hints of treason aren't going to panic me into licking foundation spittle. And now you can either give your orders or make your accusations. I don't care which. My good master traitor, I don't care an electron whether your grandfather was king of Smyrna or the greatest pauper on the planet. I recited that rigmarole about your birth and ancestry to show you that I'm not interested in them. Evidently, you missed the point. Let's go back now. You're a Smyrnian. You know the outlanders. Also, you're a traitor and one of the best. You've been to Coral and you know the Coralians. That's where you've got to go. Mallow breathed deeply, as a spy. Not at all. As a traitor. But with your eyes open. If you can find out where the power is coming from. I might remind you, since you're a Smyrnian, that two of those lost trade ships had Smyrnian crews. When do I start? When will your ship be ready? In six days. Then that's when you start. You'll have all the details at the Admiralty. Right. The trader rose, shook hands roughly, and strode out. Sut waited, spreading his fingers gingerly and rubbing out the pressure, then shrugged his shoulders and stepped into the mayor's office. The mayor deadened the visi plate and leaned back. What do you make of it, Sut? He could be a good actor, said Sut, and stared thoughtfully ahead. 2. It was evening of the same day, and in Jorane Sut's bachelor apartment on the 21st floor of the Hardin building, Publi Manlio was sipping wine slowly. It was Publi Manlio in whose slight, aging body were fulfilled two great offices of the foundation. He was foreign secretary in the mayor's cabinet, and to all the outer sons, barring only the foundation itself, he was, in addition, primate of the church, purveyor of the holy food, master of the temples, and so forth almost indefinitely in confusing but sonorous syllables. He was saying, but he agreed to let you send out that traitor. It is a point. But such a small one, said Sut. It gets us nothing immediately. The whole business is the crudest sort of stratagem, since we have no way of foreseeing it to the end. It is a mere paying out of rope on the chance that somewhere along the length of it will be a noose. True. And this Mallow is a capable man. What if he is not an easy prey to do parry? That is a chance that must be run. If there is treachery, it is the capable men that are implicated. If not, we need a capable man to detect the truth. And Mallow will be guarded. Your glass is empty. No, thanks. I've had enough. Sut filled his own glass and patiently endured the other's uneasy reverie. Of whatever the reverie consisted, it ended indecisively, for the primate said suddenly, almost explosively, Sut, what's on your mind? I'll tell you, Manlio. His thin lips parted, we're in the middle of a Selden crisis. 
Manlio stared, then said softly, How do you know? Has Selden appeared in the time vault again? That much, my friend, is not necessary. Look, reason it out. Since the Galactic Empire abandoned the periphery, and threw us on our own, we have never had an opponent who possessed nuclear power. Now, for the first time, we have won. That seems significant even if it stood by itself. And it doesn't. For the first time in over 70 years, we are facing a major domestic political crisis. I should think the synchronization of the two crises, inner and outer, puts it beyond all doubt. Manlio's eyes narrowed, if that's all, it's not enough. There have been two Selden crises so far, and both times the Foundation was in danger of extermination. Nothing can be a third crisis till that danger returns. Sut never showed impatience, that danger is coming. Any fool can tell a crisis when it arrives. The real service to the state is to detect it in embryo. Look, Manlio, we're proceeding along a planned history. We know that Harry Selden worked out the historical probabilities of the future. We know that someday we're to rebuild the Galactic Empire. We know that it will take a thousand years or thereabouts. And we know that in the interval we will face certain definite crises. Now the first crisis came 50 years after the establishment of the Foundation, and the second, 30 years later than that. Almost 75 years have gone since. It's time, Manlio, it's time. Manlio rubbed his nose uncertainly, and you've made your plans to meet this crisis. Sut nodded. And I, continued Manlio, am to play a part in it. Sut nodded again, before we can meet the foreign threat of atomic power, we've got to put our own house in order. These traitors ah. The primate stiffened, and his eyes grew sharp. That's right. These traitors. They are useful, but they are too strong. And too uncontrolled. They are outlanders, educated apart from religion. On the one hand, we put knowledge into their hands, and on the other, we remove our strongest hold upon them. If we can prove treachery. If we could, direct action would be simple and sufficient. But that doesn't signify in the least. Even if treason among them did not exist, they would form an uncertain element in our society. They wouldn't be bound to us by patriotism or common descent, or even by religious awe. Under their secular leadership, the outer provinces, which, since Hardin's time, look to us as the holy planet, might break away. I see all that, but the cure the cure must come quickly, before the Selden crisis becomes acute. If nuclear weapons are without and disaffection within, the odds might be too great. Sut put down the empty glass he had been fingering, this is obviously your job mine. I can't do it. My office is appointive and has no legislative standing. The mayor impossible. His personality is entirely negative. He is energetic only in evading responsibility. But if an independent party arose that might endanger re-election, he might allow himself to be led. But, Sut, I lack the aptitude for practical politics. Leave that to me. Who knows, Manlio? Since Salver Hardin's time, the primacy and the mayoralty have never been combined in a single person. But it might happen now. If your job were well done. 3. And at the other end of town, in homelier surroundings, Haber Mallow kept a second appointment. He had listened long, and now he said cautiously, Yes. I've heard of your campaigns to get traitor representation in the council. But why me, Twer? Jame Twer, who would remind you any time, asked or unasked, that he was in the first group of outlanders to receive a lay education at the foundation, beamed. I know what I'm doing, he said. Remember when I met you first, last year? 
at the traders' convention. Right. You ran the meeting. You had those red-necked oxen planted in their seats, then put them in your shirt pocket and walked off with them. And you're all right with the foundation masses, too. You've got glamour. Or, at any rate, solid adventure publicity, which is the same thing. Very good, said Mallow, dryly. But why now? Because now's our chance. Do you know that the Secretary of Education has handed in his resignation? It's not out in the open yet, but it will be. How do you know? That. Never mind he waved a disgusted hand. It's so. The Actionist Party is splitting wide open, and we can murder it right now on a straight question of equal rights for traitors, or, rather, democracy, pro and anti. Dot. Mallow lounged back in his chair and stared at his thick fingers, uh. uh. Sorry, twer. I'm leaving next week on business. You'll have to get someone else. Twer stared, business? What kind of business? Very super secret. Triple A priority. All that, you know. Had a talk with the mayor's own secretary. Snake Sut. James Twer grew excited. A trick. The son of a spacer is getting rid of you. Mallow hold on. Mallow's hand fell on the other's bald fist. Don't go into a blaze. If it's a trick, I'll be back some day for the reckoning. If it isn't, your snake, Sut, is playing into our hands. Listen, there's a Selden crisis coming up. Mallow waited for a reaction but it never came. Twer merely stared. What's a Selden crisis? Galaxy. Mallow exploded angrily at the anticlimax, what the blue blazes did you do when you went to school? What do you mean anyway by a fool question like that? The elder man frowned, if you'll explain there was a long pause, then, I'll explain. Mallow's eyebrows lowered, and he spoke slowly. When the Galactic Empire began to die at the edges, and when the ends of the galaxy reverted to barbarism and dropped away, Harry Selden and his band of psychologists planted a colony, the Foundation, out here in the middle of the mess, so that we could incubate art, science and technology, and form the nucleus of the Second Empire. Oh, yes, yes I'm not finished, said the traitor, coldly. The future course of the Foundation was plotted according to the science of psychohistory, then highly developed, and conditions arranged so as to bring about a series of crises that will force us most rapidly along the route to future empire. Each crisis, each Selden crisis, marks an epoch in our history. We're approaching one now. Our third. Twer shrugged. I suppose this was mentioned in school but I've been out of school a long time. Longer than you. I suppose so. Forget it. What matters is that I'm being sent out into the middle of the development of this crisis. There's no telling what I'll have when I come back, and there is a council election every year. Tour looked up, are you on the track of anything? No. You have definite plans. Not the faintest inkling of one. Well well, nothing. Harden once said. To succeed, planning alone is insufficient. One must improvise as well. I'll improvise. Tor shook his head uncertainly, and they stood, looking at each other. Mallow said, quite suddenly, but quite matter-of-factly, I tell you what, how about coming with me? Don't stare, man. You've been a traitor before you decided them was more excitement in politics. Or so I've heard. Where are you going? Tell me that. Towards the Wasallian Rift. I can't be more specific till we're out in space. What do you say? Suppose Sut decides he wants me where he can see. Not likely. If he's anxious to get rid of me, 
why not of you as well? Besides which, no traitor would hit space if he couldn't pick his own crew. I take whom I please. There was a queer glint in the older man's eyes, all right. I'll go. He held out his hand, it'll be my first trip in three years. Mallow grasped and shook the other's hand, good. All fired good. And now I've got to round up the boys. You know where the Far Star docks, don't you? Then show up tomorrow. Goodbye. 4. Coral is that frequent phenomenon in history. The Republic whose ruler has every attribute of the absolute monarch but the name. It therefore enjoyed the usual despotism unrestrained even by those two moderating influences in the legitimate monarchies. Regal honor and court etiquette. Materially, its prosperity was low. The day of the Galactic Empire had departed, with nothing but silent memorials and broken structures to testify to it. The day of the Foundation had not yet come. And in the fierce determination of its ruler, the Commodore Asper Argo, with his strict regulation of the traitors and his stricter prohibition of the missionaries, it was never coming. The spaceport itself was decrepit and decayed, and the crew of the Far Star were drearily aware of that. The moldering hangars made for a moldering atmosphere and Jame twitched and fretted over a game of solitaire. Haber Mallow said thoughtfully, good trading material here. He was staring quietly out the viewport. So far, there was little else to be said about Coral. The trip here was uneventful. The squadron of Corellian ships that had shot out to intercept the Far Star had been tiny, limping relics of ancient glory or battered, clumsy hulks. They had maintained their distance fearfully, and still maintained it, and for a week now, Mallow's requests for an audience with the local Go government had been unanswered. Mallow repeated, good trading here. You might call this virgin territory. Jame Tour looked up impatiently, and threw his cards aside, what the devil do you intend doing, Mallow? The crew's grumbling, the officers are worried, and I'm wondering wondering. About what? About the situation. And about you. What are we doing? Waiting. The old trader snorted and grew red. He growled, you're going it blind, Mallow. There's a guard around the field and there are ships overhead. Suppose they're getting ready to blow us into a hole in the ground. They've had a week. Maybe they're waiting for reinforcements. Tour's eyes were sharp and hard. Mallow sat down abruptly, yes, I'd thought of that you see, it poses a pretty problem. First, we got here without trouble. That may mean nothing, however, for only three ships out of better than three hundred went a glimmer last year. The percentage is low. But that may mean also that the number of their ships equipped with nuclear power is small, and that they dare not expose them needlessly, until that number grows. But it could mean, on the other hand, that they haven't nuclear power after all. Or maybe they have and are keeping undercover, for fear we know something. It's one thing, after all, to piratize blundering, light-armed merchant ships. It's another to fool around with an accredited envoy of the Foundation when the mere fact of his presence may mean the Foundation is growing suspicious. Combine this hold on, Mallow, hold on. Tor raised his hands. You're just about drowning me with talk. What are you getting at? Never mind the in-betweens. You've got to have the in-betweens, or you won't understand, Tor. We're both waiting. They don't know what I'm doing here and I don't know what they've got here. But I'm in the weaker position because I'm one and they're an entire world. Maybe with atomic power. I can't afford to be the one to weaken. Sure it's dangerous. Sure there may be a hole in the ground waiting for us. But we knew that from the start. What else is there to do? I don't who's that, now. Mallow looked up patiently, 
and tuned the receiver. The visi plate glowed into the craggy face of the watch sergeant. Speak, sergeant. The sergeant said, Pardon, sir. The men have given entry to a foundation missionary. A what? Mallow's face grew livid. A missionary, sit. He's in need of hospitalization, sir there'll be more than one in need of that, sergeant, for this piece of work. Order the men to battle stations. Crew's lounge was almost empty. Five minutes after the order, even the men on the off shift were at their guns. It was speed that was the great virtue in the anarchic regions of the interstellar space of the periphery, and it was in speed above all that the crew of a master trader excelled. Mallow entered slowly, and stared the missionary up and down and around. His eye slid to Lieutenant Tinter, who shifted uneasily to one side and to watch Sergeant Demen, whose blank face and stolid figure flanked the other. The master trader turned to Twer and paused thoughtfully, well, then, Twer, get the officers here quietly, except for the coordinators and the trajectorian. The men are to remain at stations till further orders. There was a five-minute hiatus, in which Mallow kicked open the doors to the lavatories, looked behind the bar, pulled the draperies across the thick windows. For half a minute he left the room altogether, and when he returned he was humming abstractedly. Men filed in. Twer followed, and closed the door silently. Mallow said quietly, First, who let this man in without orders from me? The watch sergeant stepped forward. Every eye shifted. Pardon, sir. It was no definite person. It was a sort of mutual agreement. He was one of us, you might say, and these foreigners here Mallow cut him short. I sympathize with your feelings, sergeant, and understand them. These men, were they under your command? Yes, sir. When this is over, they're to be confined to individual quarters for a week. You yourself are relieved of all supervisory duties for a similar period. Understood. The sergeant's face never changed, but there was the slightest droop to his shoulders. He said, Crisply, yes, sir. You may leave. Get to your gun station. The door closed behind him and the babble rose. Twer broke in, why the punishment, Mallow? You know that these Coralians kill captured missionaries. An action against my orders is bad in itself whatever other reasons there may be in its favor. No one was to leave or enter the ship without permission. Lieutenant Tinter murmured rebelliously, seven days without action. You can't maintain discipline that way. Mallow said icily, I can. There's no merit in discipline under ideal circumstances. I'll have it in the face of death, or it's useless. Where's this missionary? Get him here in front of me. The traitor sat down, while the scarlet-cloaked figure was carefully brought forward. What's your name, Reverend? At. The scarlet-robed figure wheeled towards Mallow, the whole body turning as a unit. His eyes were blankly open and there was a bruise on one temple. Audiobook generated by, Read with the Ears.